good morning. I want to say hello to everybody here that's in the building, everybody who's watching online, and uh, everybody whose favorite team won yesterday. I don't know whether your team won or lost. My team didn't play, so I didn't care. But anyway, I'm glad that you came. And let me just begin. There's a lot of things I want to say, but I just want to begin by telling you about a guy named Peter Gibbon. He's a researcher at Harvard University. He's been going around the country, and he's been drawing tremendous crowds, but it's what he's talking about that fascinates me. And what he's lamenting is the loss of heroes in our society. And he said part of the reason why we don't have heroes anymore is because the media is just hell-bent on negativity. And they, they always tell us the worst about everyone, and they do it over and over and over. And the reason why they do it is because it sells. It's, we've gotten so cynical as a society, we don't want to hear the good stuff. We want to hear the bad stuff. And he said, as a result, there's really no public admiration for almost anybody anymore. I got to thinking about it, and you know, most of the people that we call heroes are really just either overrated movie stars, or overpaid athletes, or overindulged celebrities, or overhyped influencers. And today, heroism is, is, is being famous and rich. And when you look around, real, honest to goodness, heroes are just harder and harder to find, which is one of the reasons why I love the Bible. Because the Bible contains stories of some of the greatest heroes and some of the greatest heroines, not just of the faith, but actually in the entire world. Now, to be sure, when you read about these heroes, almost every one of them, they had their faults and they had their failures, and the Bible doesn't try to hide them. But at the end of the day, they're heroes for two reasons. Number one, because of the way that they lived, and number two, because of the way that they died. Now, if you're a guest of ours today, you're just tuning in for the first time, we've been in a series we've been calling The God Life. And I don't mind telling you, I had a little fear and trepidation going in, because when you go back and preach about a man that lived thousands of years ago, you wonder how it's really going to relate to a 21st century audience. And yet, frankly, this series we're calling The God Life about a prophet named Elijah, I probably got more positive feedback on this series than I've on anything that I've done in a really long time. And we're kind of coming to the end. This is the last message of the series. And the reason why I love Elijah is not just because he was a great hero, but I love it because James said he was a man just like us. And so I know when I read the life of Elijah, I can live the way he lived because he was a man just like me. But he's going to teach us today not just how to live the God life, but how to die God's way. And so I just want to share something with you because one day we're all, unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to die. And I just want to give you a thought, and the thought is this, you're not ready to die until you've lived the right way. You're just not ready to die until you've lived the right way. So I want you to do this. If you brought your Bibles today, I want you to turn to a book called Kings, Second Kings, it's right after First Kings. Go, go to Genesis, turn right, go about eight or nine books, you'll hit it. Second Kings chapter two. We're coming to the end of a God life. And it really is a fascinating story for this reason. Thomas Paine, one of our nation's founding fathers, once said this, nothing is more certain than death and nothing more uncertain than the time of dying. But here's what's fascinating about Elijah. That wasn't true of Elijah. You're gonna to see today that he knew his earthly life was going to end and he knew when. Because the way his story winds up, it's all about the day that he knew was going to be his last day. Now, most of us, we don't know which day, but one day will be our last day. We're going to exit this life and we're going to enter into the next one. I remember when I was president of the Southern Baptist Convention and I was presiding over my last session and I really was glad. It was a, it's a two-year deal if you run for your election, which I did. But it's just a real burden to be in. And I was pastoring a church and all of that. I was really glad that it was over with. And so I, I, I hit the gavel and, and, you know, we were all dismissed. And I turned around and there was Adrian Rogers standing right there. His arms were folded, just smiling at me. And I, I said, Dr. Rogers, so good to see you. And, he, you know, he was my mentor. Never will forget what he did. He put his arm around me. 
And he said, James, do you see that sign above that door over there, that flashing sign? I said, yes, sir. He said, what is it? He said, that's an, I said, that's an exit sign. He said, that's exactly what you are now. You are an ex-it. <laughs> he was joking. But, but, but one day, we're all going to be an ex-it. Unless Jesus come first, we're all going to take this exit called death. And we're going to be an ex-it. We're going to learn today from this great prophet who lived the great, right, this wonderful great life. And here's what we're going to learn. And please hear me. You better take the right exit and you better exit right. So what is the lesson we're going to take away from Elijah as we close this series today? Here's what I want you to learn. The greatest legacy you can leave is when you leave a life well lived. The greatest legacy you can leave is when you leave a life well lived. So however you die, whenever you die, wherever you die, I want to tell you three things that ought to be true and will be true and should be true if you live the God life. So when you prepare to take your final exit, three things to remember. First of all, when you take that exit, you should always, first of all, follow God's plan. You were put on this earth. God has a plan for your life. And the first thing, the last thing, the final thing we ought to be doing before we die is we follow God's plan. Now, the story really kind of gets interesting, and you have to kind of stay with it to see where he's going. It begins with a simple statement. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Now, we're told something about Elijah right up front. The exit sign is flashing. Elijah knows today is the day. I'm going to take my leave. God is about to take Elijah up to heaven. And what's interesting is not only did Elijah know he was going to leave that day, but evidently his heir apparent, the guy that was going to take his place, he also knew it too. So we keep reading. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now watch this. The company of the prophets, we'll talk about them in a minute. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Evidently, they knew it too. Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. <laughs> That's a good word. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as sure as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Now, as you read this story, you got to keep one thing in mind. This is Elijah's last day. He knows it's going to be his last day. He knows he will not be here tomorrow. And it's really interesting to learn that his last day is going to be a long day. And let me tell you why. Remember we talked about the company of the prophets? Well, back in the day, there were things like we call seminaries today, and they were called the schools of the prophets. And there were actually three of them. They were located in three places, the three places they were going to go, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. So God is going to take Elijah from Jerusalem to Gilgal, then to Jericho. That was a trip of about 30 miles. Then he's going to take him to the Jordan River where he's going to be crossing over the Jordan River and he will be taken up to heaven. But as I'm reading this and I'm studying this, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I've got a question here. Knowing this was his last day, knowing this would be the only day he would live the rest of his life on this earth, why was God leading him from Jerusalem to Gilgal and then from Gilgal to Bethel, and then from Bethel to Jericho, and then across the Jordan River. Well, there were actually two reasons. First of all, this was a trip down memory lane. You know, some people say that when they're about to die, they see their whole life flash before them. Well, this was kind of what God was doing for Elijah, because every one of these places were significant, both for the nation of Israel and for Elijah. Let's take Gilgal. Where was Gilgal? Gilgal was the place where the children of Israel first camped before they finally crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. So for the nation of Israel, this is really where their God life really began. 40 years they'd been in the wilderness. 40 years they'd been looking for the Promised Land. 40 years they'd been looking to cross over. They finally get to Gilgal and they now see the Promised Land. Well, then they go from Gilgal to Bethel. Why did they go to Bethel? Well, the word Bethel literally means the house of God. And that symbolizes the presence of God. And that's how Elijah had lived all of his life. He had lived every moment of his life in the presence 
of God. Then he leaves Gilgal and he leaves Bethel and he goes to Jericho. Why does God take him to Jericho? Well, this was the first place that Israel conquered when they took the promised land. In fact, Pastor Chuck Swindoll said this. He said what Normandy was to the Allied forces in World War II, Jericho was to the Israelites. So when they get to, to, to Jericho, Elijah's thinking to himself, man, can I relate to this place? Because if you've been with me in this study, you know that Elijah's life has basically been one battle after another battle, after another battle, after another battle. It seems he's always been in a battle. He's had his share of battles, and now he's remembering all the victories that God had won, but there's one more place he's got to go. He's got to go to the Jordan River. Why does he have to go to the Jordan River? Because the Jordan River symbolizes dying. It symbolizes crossing over to the other side. And so Elijah knows I've got to go to the Jordan. I've got to cross over to the Jordan because I'm going to leave this land for another land. I'm going to leave this life for another life. So God's doing Elijah a favor. He says, Elijah, I want you to take one last look at the God life that you had lived before I take you into heaven. That was the first reason. But there's another reason. I think it's even a better reason, even a greater reason. Remember the school of the prophets, these seminary students? Well, they'd been called to ministry just like Elijah. And we know that Elijah had taught these men and he had been involved with these men and maybe some of them had been called under his ministry. And so there's this one last ministry God has for Elijah to perform. He says, I want you to go to these young men. Elijah, I want you to meet with them. I want you to encourage them. I want you to give them a last word of doctrine, a last word of teaching. I want you to exhort them. I want you to urge them to live the God life. I want you to urge them to lead others to live the God life. I want you to remind them that they belong to me. Their life belongs to me, just like your life belonged to me. So I want you to have one last chance to have a real great influence on these guys. So you see what God is doing. God has a plan for Elijah's life. God has a work for Elijah to do. And that plan is not finished. And that work does not end until you exit right. Now, let me tell you why I want you to listen to this. This is so important. How many times have you said something like this? If I knew today was the last day I'd live, I'd get my affairs in order. I'd make the calls that I ought to make. I'll see the people I ought to see. I'll do the things that I ought to do. Really? Then let me give you a piece of advice. Why don't you treat every day like it's your last day? Why don't you live every day like it is your last day? Because whether it's your first day or your last day, God has a plan for that day. So if you were to ask me, so what will you do on your last day? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I'll be doing every day. The great Christian saint, St. Francis of Assisi, was a truly devoted follower of Jesus. Somebody said to him one time, they said, Francis, what would you do if you knew you were going to die today at sunset? You know what he said? I'd keep hoeing my garden. I just keep holding my garden. I do what I believe God's called me to do because when you live the last, when you live the God life, you live as if every day was your last day. As a matter of fact, on that day, you would do what you believe God would want you to do if it was not going to be your last day. You would follow God's plan. That's what the God life does. The plan never ends, the work's never over till God says, you're done. So the first thing, when you live the God life, when you exit right, take the right exit, you will follow God's plan. Now, here's the second thing will happen to you and will be true of you if you live the God life. When you live the God life, when you come time to take your exit, this is the good news. You will go to God's presence. You follow God's plan, but you go to God's presence. Now, we're going to do something. We're going to skip a part of the story and come back to it. I want to move ahead. Elijah and Elisha, they've now crossed over the Jordan. They're, they're walking along. They're just having a time of conversation, having a time of, of just enjoying each other's company, enjoying each other's fellowship. And here's what we read. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out. My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it 
in two. Two times and only two times in the Bible are we told of people who had what I call a deathless departure. I call it an eternal exit. Only two people, not just in the Bible, as far as I know, only two people in history have ever exited this earth without going through the door of death. They're the only two people who were ushered immediately from earth directly into heaven. Now, some of you may not know the first one. Some of you remember there was a man named Enoch. You go back to Genesis chapter five, and here's what we're told. We're not told a lot about Enoch. We're just told really this one big thing about Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and God took him. That's all we're told. Enoch walked with God, and God took him. He just one of a sudden, he was here one second, gone the next. Well, the second guy, it's, it's Elijah, and he's taken up in a whirlwind. Now, why do you think that's in the Bible? Why do you think God did that? Remember, everything in the Old Testament is pointing to what's in the New Testament. And what you're seeing here is a picture of how one day there's going to be one other group of people, maybe us. You're going to experience the same thing as believers. Jesus is going to return, and Jesus is going to rapture those of us who are still alive, and we really won't die. But in the meantime, what about those of us here right now? We're kind of in no man's land because we really don't know when we're going to die. We really don't know how we're going to die. And we really don't know where we're going to die. But that raises a question. And I'll be honest, the answer for me is no. I mean, but here's my question. Would you really want to know when you'll die? I mean, if God said, okay, I'll tell you if you want to know. I mean, would you really want to know when you'll die? I, I, one time I, I told the Lord this, maybe 20 years ago. I said, oh, God, just don't let me die until Georgia wins one more national championship. That's all I'm asking. But really, would you really want to know when you'll die? By the way, if you're one of those people that say, you know, I would like to know when I'm going to die. Well, I got news for you. There is a watch that you can buy, I'm not making this up, that can predict your death to the nearest second. I'm not making this up. It's called the ticker watch. We'll put it up on the screen. It's called the ticker watch. I'm not making this up. Now listen to this. This watch will ask you a set of questions about your medical history. They'll then take your age and they'll subtract it from your answers to get the estimated death date. Then when you set the clock, guess what? This is so good. The countdown begins. <laughs> Years, days, hours, minutes, and seconds. Supposedly we'll count down to the very second you're going to take your final exit. Now, some people have called this the death watch. Well, the guy that invented this was a Swede by the name of Frederick Colting, and he doesn't like that name because he thinks it's real morbid. He says, I don't call it the death watch. I call it the happiness watch. Do you know why he calls it the happiness watch? He says, look, if you know when you're going to die, it will help you make the most of your time and cherish the time that you have left. Well, he wasted his money because you don't need a watch to want to do that. Because what I want you to see is this. This is what Elisha is teaching us. When you live the God life, then it doesn't matter where you die or when you die or how you die. If you live the God life, you are going to heaven. Can I get an amen to that? You are going to heaven. I love the story. I read it. There was a 95-year-old woman, and she was in a nursing home, and her pastor came to visit with her, and he said, Miss Smith, how are you feeling? She said, oh, pastor, I'm just worried sick. And he said, well, well what's wrong? He said, do you, are you having any pain? She said, no, I, I really feel great. Well, have you had a checkup lately? Yeah, my checkup's fine. He said, well, what in the world are you worrying about? She said, pastor, every one of my close friends has died, and every one of them has gone to heaven. And I'm just worried that they're wondering, where am I? <laughs> now, you don't have to worry about where you are. If you live the good life wherever and whenever and however you live this earth, you will exit right, you will take the right exit, and you will go to heaven. I, I got to the privilege and honor years and years ago on several occasions, I got to meet George H.W. Bush, George Bush's dad. This was after he became, well, actually, I met him while he was president. And then my, I had two of my sons. We were invited to a dinner, and I actually got to sit at the table. It was him, my two sons, and a guy running for governor. And I got to meet with the, with the president, just a wonderful, wonderful man. Well, on November the 29th, 2018, President Bush was 94 years old. 
He did not know it, but this would be his next to last day on earth. He didn't know that. Well, his best friend was James Baker, who served with him in his administration, and he visited with him every day. So whenever he would walk in, he would always say to the president, this, he'd always ask him this question, so where are we going today? Well, this day, Bush asked the question first. He called him Bake. He said, Bake, where are we going today? This time, his longtime friend said this. He said, well, Mr. President, we're going to heaven. To which Bush replied, good, because that's where I want to go. I don't mind telling you, that's where I want to go. That's where I am going. That's where you should want to go. And that's where you can go. The good life ends by going to God's presence. But up to that moment, remember, until, we're, until we exit, until we take that exit door, till we leave this earth, not only are we to follow God's plan, we know we'll go to God's presence, but in the meantime, and this is the most important part of the sermon, we are to live in God's power. We are to live in God's power. Now, I want to take you back to the part of the story that takes place before Elijah's taken to heaven. Remember the story? Elijah and Elisha, they're standing on the banks of the Jordan. They've got to cross over. They, they, they're not over there yet. They've got to cross over, but the water is too high. Now, here's what's interesting. All these seminarians had heard, hey, Elijah's going to heaven. He's not going to be here after today. So they came from Bethel. They came from Gilgal. They came from Jericho. And all these seminary students, they're, they're standing off, and they're kind of watching, and they want to see what's going to happen. Because Elijah was their mentor. Elijah was their hero. And they're wondering, okay, what, what's he going to do next? And then they saw this. 50 men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Again, question. Why did Elijah leave the promised land and cross over to the other side of the Jordan? I mean, after all, God could have taken him to heaven right there. He didn't have to cross over the Jordan. He didn't have to go from Bethel or Jericho. He didn't have to leave Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, he wouldn't even have to perform this last miracle. But why did God do it that way? Why did God say, no, I want you to go to the Jordan. I want you to cross over the Jordan and I want you to do one last great work because he wanted to remind both these young seminarians and this successor named Elisha that the God life can only be lived in the power of God. The God life can only be lived in the power of God. See, Elisha, he's got a problem. Now they've crossed over. And Elijah's taken to heaven. But Elisha's got to get back home. And he's got this raging river overflowing his banks and he can't get back across on his own. So what's he going to do? Well, guess what? He's got to believe the same God that Elijah did for the same power that Elijah had. And deep down, Elisha knew this because here's what we read in verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. Now remember, if you didn't know this, Elisha has been living with Elijah nine years. Nine years he's been following his coattails. Nine years he's been following in his steps. Nine years he's been mentored by this man. He's been listening to this man. He's been taught by this man. And after nine years, Elisha knew what his secret sauce was. Because from the time that Elijah became on the scene, he had followed God's plan. He had lived in God's power. Now he's going to God's presence. And the same trusting heart and the same holy power that Elijah had, Elisha said, I want double what you got. I want double what's in your heart. I've watched you for nine years. You stood against prophets. You stood against kings. You stood against enemies. You've had a wanted dead or alive poster on you. You've been the most hunted man in the world. You never flinched. You never blinked. You never got worried. You never got scared. You lived in the full confidence and trust of God. I've seen you do miracle after miracle after miracle. I want double of what you've got. And I, I was reading this in my study. And this is what I said to the Lord. I 
I want people to see the power of God in our church. I want people to see the power of God in your life. I want people to see the power of God when I stand up to preach. I want people to see the power of God in the words that we use, in the work that we do, in the walk that we take. I want people to see us to live the God life. So you've got these 50, you've got these young seminarians, they're looking at a distance, they're wondering, what is Elisha going to do? Will he measure up to his master? Will he follow God's plan? Will he still believe that one day he'll go to God's presence? Because in the meantime, they're saying, okay, are you going to do it the way Elisha did it? Elijah did it? Are you going to minister in God's power? What's the answer? Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. Now, I read that quick, but I'm going to go back slowly because most of you missed exactly what happened. I missed it the first time I read it. Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak and he struck the water. But, Jerry, the water didn't part. You didn't see that. He struck the water, but it didn't part. He could have struck that water a hundred times and it wouldn't have parted. It didn't part until he asked this question. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now you say, Pastor, why is that such a big deal? Because when he struck that water and that water parted and he crossed over, all those seminary students all of a sudden got it. The power was not in the cloak. The power is not even in the hand of the prophet that wielded the cloak. The power was in God. Elijah is gone, but God is not. And I say that to say this. I won't always be the pastor of this church. I don't know when my time's coming to a close. I hope you're not going to try to run me off tomorrow, but I'm looking out and I'm looking ahead and I'm not getting younger. And one day I'll take that exit as the pastor of this church for the last time. And I want you to hear me clearly. God's power and God's plan and God's purpose is never limited to a place. It's never limited to a person. It's never limited to a period. Men and women of God come, men and women of God go. But the God of those men and women never leaves, ever leaves. The work never stops. That's why I want to say three things about God just for a moment. Just want to have a God moment. So we're talking about the God life. That's why God alone is indispensable. Pastors come and go. <laughs> we're about to have an election. I got news for you. Presidents live and die. Presidents come and go. But both a church and a nation need God. You don't need me. You need God. I don't need you. I need God. We don't really just need each other. We need God. Only God is indispensable. Number two, only God is imperishable. The leaders don't leave us, but they're taken from us. Listen, the Elishas don't always stay around. The Elijahs don't always stay around. The Charles Spurgeons don't always stay around. The Adrian Rogers don't always stay around. The Billy Grahams don't always stay around. But God never leaves. God's always here. God never goes anywhere. Only God is imperishable and only God is irrefutable. Even the greatest of the heroes in the Bible were not perfect. Even the great prophets and leaders made mistakes. Sometimes they were wrong. They had to be corrected. Sometimes their ways had to be rejected. But God can always be trusted to say the right words, lead the right way, and do the right thing. Because here's what I want you to remember. For every exit, there's an entrance. For everyone who leaves, there's someone who comes. So what did we just read? Exit Elijah, enter Elijah. Elisha. 
One person's exit led to another person's entrance. So I want to, I said all of that to say this. If you haven't learned anything about the God life, this is the lesson I want you to take away. God can do his work without us, but we cannot do our work without God. God can do our work without us, but we cannot do our work without God. It's a great day in the life of every young pastor, and every young pastor has this moment in different ways, different times, but it's a great day in the life of a young pastor when he realizes, I don't care how educated I am, I don't care how erudite I am, I don't care how great a communicator I am, I don't care what a great mind I might have, I don't care what great alliteration and illustration I can put into a sermon, God doesn't need me, I need him. I can't do it without him. He can do it without me. And that's why the most humble person in the world are people who have been saved, people who have been called, and people who have been chosen by the Lord to be a part of his family. It will be such a humbling thing because one of the reasons why the father sent the son to die on the cross and come back from the grave, you know why he did that? So he could send the spirit, the same spirit that was in Elijah, to live in every one of us, enable us to live the God life until the end of life life when the God who gave us that life takes that life to be with him forever. So we've been preaching on the God life week after week after week after week. And we come to the question I ask you at the very first time I preached the very first sermon, you got a choice. Are you going to be satisfied with just living the good life? Or is there a hunger and a desire in your heart by the power of God to live the God life? It's a life that points people to Jesus. It's a life that inspires them to the cross-shaped life, which really is the God life. I wrote a name down on a wall this morning, someone I'll be talking to very soon, who doesn't even believe in God. And I prayed and fasted that this person would see the God life in me. I flew to Texas last week. God called me to Texas to watch Georgia play Texas. <laughs> so I flew to Texas, took a 10 o'clock flight Friday night, fly out and flew back early Sunday morning. I walked into the airport and I sat down and there was a guy sitting there and I said, how are you doing? And he said, I'm doing fine. And uh, he looked at me and I said, I, I'm James. He said, I'm Stuart. I said, it's good to meet you, Stuart. Are you James Merritt? Yeah. <laughs> I watch you every Sunday on TV. I can't believe I'm meeting you. His name was Stuart. Struck up a great conversation. Landed at the airport at 1125, and Stuart had sent me to the airport. He says, hey, where are you going? I said, well, I'm staying at a hotel called Round Rock. And he said, that's where I'm going. I can stay with a buddy of mine. Why don't we take an Uber together? I said, man, that'd be great. I said, you're paying for it? He said, yeah. I said, man, we're in. <laughs> so this is important. He calls this Uber driver, okay? Just Uber driver shows up. Uber driver's name is Andre. So we get in the Uber, which I said, Andre, how long is the, the, the drive? So about 30 minutes. I said, great. How long have you been driving an Uber? He's been driving an Uber for about five years. I said, man, that's great. I was going to ask you a question. He said, yeah. I said, has anybody you've ever picked up talked to you about Jesus? I said, no. I said, would you mind if I talk to you about Jesus? He said, I'd like to hear about Jesus. So I shared the bad news and the worst news and the good news, and the best news. And we got to Round Rock, and he, turned, he stopped the car, and he turned and he looked at me, and he said, that is the best news I've ever heard in my life. I want to give my life to Jesus. So right there in Round Rock, round, right, right there, there, Andre, 31 years old, never married, Andre prays and gives his life to Jesus. Now, I want you to listen carefully. I am not the hero of the story. He's the hero of the story. I just live in the God life. That's all I was doing. And that's what you can do. That's what Elisha did. That's what you do every day when you say, God, just for today, I want to follow your plan. 
I want to live in your power because one day I'm going to go to your presence. And I want to be that kind of man that somebody looks at that man's life and somebody looks at your life, somebody looks at my life, and they say, your life is different from my life. I want what is in your life. So I'll leave you with this last story. The courtiers of Henry IV of France were complimenting him on how strong he was. He was getting older, and in fact, they, they even said to him, you know, because a lot of people didn't do this back in the day, they said, you might live to be 80 years of age, which few people did. Well, when they said that to the king, this is what the king said back to them. He said, the number of our days is reckoned. I've often prayed to God for grace, but never for a long life. A man who has lived well has always lived long enough, however early he may die. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, my young people, the greatest legacy you can leave when you exit this world is to leave a life well lived. And if you take that exit through a cross and an empty tomb, you will exit right because you will have taken the right exit. Would you pray with me? I have a question for every one of you in this room. How would you describe your life right now? A good life or the God life? If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you cannot live the God life because the God life really is simple. It's when God lives in you and God doesn't come to live in you until you come and accept the one who died for you. So if you're watching this program right now and you're listening by, uh, on a computer or you're watching TV or you're in this building and you've never, ever, ever given your life to Jesus Christ, I just want to give you the opportunity to do what Andre did a week ago this past Friday. Would you be willing just to pray a prayer like this? Would you be willing to pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I need to be saved. I, I can't save myself, but I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. I believe you're alive right now. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I surrender all that I am to all that you are. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me today. Thank you for giving me eternal life. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, God saved you. For the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you prayed that prayer and you're watching online right now, would you just go to crosspointchurch.com slash next? Just let us know that you prayed to receive Christ today. we just like to contact you and help you begin your new walk with God. If you are in this room today and you prayed and you asked Christ into your heart just then, just now, when this service is over, there will be a table out in the lobby. It's called Next Steps, right in the middle of the lobby. Would you just go to that table and just tell them, hey, I made this decision. I gave my life to Christ today. That's all you need to say. We're just going to give you some material that help you begin your walk with God and you'll be on your way. Some of you say, I, well, I, I know Jesus. Are you living the God life? Well, yeah, I am. Well, the God life is an obedient life. Do you know the very first thing you've got to do to obey God when you give your life to Christ? Be biblically baptized. We're going to be baptizing at the next hour. Some of you have never been biblically baptized. You got sprinkled when you were a baby. You got wet when you didn't know what you were doing, but you've never been biblically baptized. Maybe you need to go to that table and say, I need to, I need to follow Christ in baptism. Or maybe you've been coming here for a while and you need to join this church. Or maybe you need to find a place to serve. Maybe you need to get involved in a small group where you can be discipled and you can encourage other people to be what they ought to be for God. Father, my prayer in the name of Jesus, as always, is that you'd honor your word. Don't let it return void. Let it accomplish what you please. Let it prosper in the thing for which you sent it. And I'll bless you and praise you for what you'll do. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.